Sir. Mr. President, I have a second uh, UC request. Uh, un understanding that request, I agree with you on the request, and we will work to see if we can accomplish something that would be satisfactory. Um, now, now I rise to seek consent to advance the nomination of, of a friend and a Virginian, Leopoldo Martinez, for executive director of the Inter-American Development Bank. I did this a few weeks ago, but the important need of America to have an IDB that is investing in the region to counter Chinese investments that are occurring every day has become even more apparent to me because since the last time I took the floor to promote Mr. Martinez, I have visited the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, and Panama and seen the tremendous competition that we're up against. The IDB is the largest source of international financing, development financing for Latin America and the Caribbean. It's of national interest for the United States to build up the economic prosperity of the countries of the Western Hemisphere. As Latin America and the Caribbean continue to face challenges from COVID-19, where the region had the highest global per capita infection and death rate, 8% of the world's population is in Latin America, 30% of world's COVID deaths were in Latin America. It's also experiencing the largest economic contraction of any region in the world. The IDB plays a key role in improving economic outcomes for the region. We've seen again and again that when these countries have troubled economies, it's not a distant or far away problem. It drives government corruption, organized crime, drug abuse, drug trafficking, and irregular migration that can start as a country's problems, but very quickly they expand beyond the borders of the country to affect other nations, including the U.S. When we don't step up, we see China, Russia, and Iran and other nations step up. Over the last decade, China's investments in Latin America have ballooned. They are moving aggressively and rapidly in this space in 2020. Just for a pre-pandemic example, China's direct investments in Latin America were roughly $17 billion. The Chinese Development Bank and the Export-Import Bank of China, both of which I know are state-owned, are among the region's leading lenders. So between 05 and 2020, these two banks together loaned around $137 billion to Latin American governments. So what does that matter to us? Well, the cost of American interest is very clear. In exchange for these funds, China gets favorable access to oil resources. They support and control high-value strategic energy and infrastructure projects. They force tough decisions on the recognition or the removal of recognition of Taiwan. The Dominican Republic and Nicaragua flipped their positions after being offered financial incentives by China. The few holdouts left, like Haiti are facing increased pressure to do so as well. So how do we push back? It's the IDB that allows us to push back. In 2021, despite the pandemic, the IDB pumped $28.3 billion in investments, loans, and assistance into the region. I would note that China is now a voting member of the IDB. Our absence has a direct impact on China's ability to exert influence even with the, within the IDB structure itself. Now, again, my colleagues across the aisle, they want a more muscular approach on China. They're right. They accuse the Biden administration of not doing enough, of being soft. But if you look at the extraordinary effort they're putting into block qualified nominees across the region without any justification that meets my standards, it's clear that, wait a minute, are these blocks of nominations in the Western Hemisphere, are they helping us stand up to China? Are they making it harder for us to do that? If we can't even take the step of approving ambassadors and putting key people in place that will use U.S. resources to exert our more pro-democratic influence, what is the outcome? China has an active and growing presence right here in the neighborhood, failing to confirm Leopoldo and these other nominees based off of accusations and unrelated policy concerns, I think is malpractice in terms of our foreign policy. Mr. Martinez is the right man for the job at the IDB. He brings decades of experience in the public and private sectors, as well as academia. He has extensive experience advising Fortune 500 companies, private equity funds, international businesses, and non-governmental organizations. He's the CEO of the Center for Democracy and Development of the Americas, as well as Commissioner for Small Business of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and on the Board of Visitors at the University of Mary Washington. He is a constituent, and I'll admit to the personal bias that he is also a friend, a person of high integrity that I've known for years and can vouch for. Now, I want to take now a minute just to 
respond to some comments that were made by my friend, and he is a friend from Texas, about Mr. Martinez's background when we last discussed this nomination in September. Mr. Martinez was then labeled, accused actually, somehow of being a Chavezista or a Maduro regime sympathizer. Um, I responded without notes on that day, but I want to go a little deeper into it to tell you about Leo's personal history because that personal history is a significant and painful one, and it suggests that him being branded as a Chavezista could not be further from the truth. Yes, Leo Martinez is a former Venezuela politician. He was elected to his role in the Venezuelan parliament in opposition to Hugo Chavez. His consistent, strong, and public opposition to Chavez resulted in his persecution by that regime. For this reason, he had to flee to the United States in 2005 to escape persecution by a regime and a very real threat of imprisonment. The regime confiscated all of his family's assets. The idea that someone who had the courage to risk his life to oppose Chavez, who quite literally fled from the regime's attacks, who's had his family wealth seized by the Chavez regime, who was in the United States and eligible for this nomination because of his opposition to the regime. To claim that that person is somehow a Chavezista, Chavezista is just outrageous. But don't take my word for it. When the accusations were made in September, they were thoroughly debunked by fact checkers. Univision went line by line through the accusations and found them to be grossly incorrect. Or the very day that President Biden nominated Leo for this role, the Maduro regime put a communications official on Venezuelan national TV and accused him of being a traitor. That's what the Maduro regime says about this nominee that President Biden has put forward to carry forward U.S. interests, including our U.S. interests in calling for accountability in Venezuela. Does that sound like a Chavezista to anyone? A person who would be branded a traitor by the Maduro regime because of being too pro-American? Ultimately, I understand and respect their differences of opinion within the Senate on some of the Biden administration's policies on Latin America. And I also admit that this is a challenging region with a number of challenges that are immune from easy answers. But strong opposition is one thing, and we're all free to offer bills and amendments to go in a different direction and to ask the Senate to vote them. But I would ask my colleagues, all of them, what does keeping the U.S. as executive director position at IDB vacant accomplish for us? As we try to make smart investments in Latin America to get at the root causes of problems like migration, is hobbling the most important organization charged with financing our goal really helpful? With that said, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee be discharged and the Senate proceed to the following nomination. PN 1028, Leopoldo Martinez Nusete, to be United States Executive Director for the Inter-American Development Bank for a term of three years to succeed Elliot Pedrosa, that the Senate vote on the nomination with no intervening action or debate, that the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table, that no further motions be in order on the nomination, that any related statements be printed in the record, and that the President be immediately notified of the Senate's action. Reserve objection. Mr. President. Senator from Texas. Reserving the right to object. In September, Democrats asked unanimous consent to the confirmation of Mr. Martinez Nusete. I objected. At the time, I explained that President Biden has been pursuing a policy in Latin America that has given momentum to the hard left, pro-Chavez, pro-Castro, anti-American movements across the hemisphere. Indeed, I have explained at considerable length my deep opposition to the misguided foreign policy of President Biden and his administration. This president and this administration has consistently shown weakness and appeasement to the enemies of America, whether communist China or Russia or Iran or Venezuela. 
while at the same time demonstrating deep animosity to friends and allies of America. It's a foreign policy that I believe is precisely backwards if the objective were defending U.S. national security interest. President Trump, the previous president, frequently described his foreign policy as an America first foreign policy. One of the best descriptions that can be given of President Biden and the Democrats' foreign policy is an America last foreign policy. Every region on earth has gotten worse, more hostile to America, and more dangerous in the two years that Joe Biden has been president. And yet no region has been hurt more than Latin America. President Biden came into office and immediately froze out pro-American governments in Latin America. For example, he went out of his way to undermine and to alienate the government of Colombian President Ivan Duque. He denied Duque a phone call for the first five months of the administration, providing morale and momentum to Duque's domestic enemies. And so, the predictable result occurred. The Colombian far left gained more and more momentum, and a few months ago, leftist Gustavo Petro took control of Colombia, a former terrorist with a long record of deep anti-American animosity. Since then, things have only gotten worse. In the aftermath of recent elections, Lula da Silva is set to take control of Brazil, the largest country in Latin America. And of course, Biden immediately picked up the phone to call Lula to congratulate him. I'll note, during the same few days, it took Biden a full week to call and congratulate Benjamin Netanyahu, who had just won election to be the next prime minister of our dear friend and ally, Israel. But for the Biden administration, they were thrilled to see an anti-American leftist like Lula in power. And they were deeply dismayed to see a pro-American friend and ally like Netanyahu in power. Just last week, the Biden administration announced that it was providing sanctions relief to the Maduro regime in Venezuela. Mr. President, mark my words. I believe this administration is moving step by step systematically towards formally recognizing the Maduro regime. That would be a catastrophic mistake. I think the Biden administration would do it expeditiously. They'd do it today if they could. But they know the political costs are high, so instead they're advancing incrementally, inch by inch. Right now, they're starting to unwind sanctions on Venezuelan oil while continuing to stifle drilling here at home, forcing American energy producers to seek oil from dictators and enemies of America rather than produce high-paying jobs here in the United States. And I might note that oil produced in the United States is produced much more cleanly, emits less carbon, emits less pollutants than does the foreign oil. And yet the Biden foreign policy is such that they relish putting billions in the coffers of dictators. Back in September, I said that the Senate badly needed to debate the trajectory and the likely consequences of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's disastrous Latin America policy, and that the nomination of Mr. Martinez Nusete for executive director of the IADB was particularly problematic in this context. Mr. Martinez Nusete has a long career of being a hard left partisan. In Venezuela, he served as a socialist congressman during the tenure of Hugo Chavez. His nomination is both an example of, and if confirmed, he would fuel the Biden administration's ongoing effort to drag Latin America to the far left, 
to empower anti-American Marxists throughout the region. I just listened to the words of my friend and colleague, the senator from Virginia, claiming that in actuality, Mr. Martinez Nusete was not the kind of Venezuelan socialist who supported Chavez. He was a different kind of Venezuelan socialist. He doesn't dispute that he's a Venezuelan socialist former congressman, but he says, no, he wasn't exactly of the same flavor of Chavez. I will say I'm not particularly interested in slicing and dicing the varieties of socialists in Latin America operating in Chavez's Venezuela. I'm opposed to former socialist congressmen of foreign nations representing the United States of America in any context, let alone in international banks. I will say, my colleague from Virginia spoke movingly about the importance of the IADB. I agree. We should have an American representative on that bank. And that underscores the need for President Biden to withdraw this nomination and nominate someone with experience who would advocate for America and not for the far left in Latin America. I'll note also that Mr. Martinez Nusete failed to advance favorably out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee because every single Republican in the committee voted against him. And it was not just his record as a former socialist congressman. One of the significant concerns was his deeply manifested hostility to religion and the people of faith. That hostility was demonstrated in answers and written testimony provided by Mr. Martinez Ossete in response to questions that I asked him. These answers demonstrated a bizarre and a disturbing hostility an antipathy for conservatives, for people of faith, and especially for conservative people of faith. And let me note specifically what the concerns were. I asked Mr. Martinez Nusete in writing about his views and to what extent faith should be disentangled from development. Development often employs and is deeply involved with faith-based nonprofits throughout the developing world. Here was his answer, quote, there should be no entanglement between government and religion. That is a bedrock constitutional pr principle for us in America. I don't think any particular culture or religion is superior to others in terms of achieving socioeconomic development. That answer was non-responsive and deeply confused. So I asked more precisely for Mr. Martinez Nusseta to describe the role that faith plays in economic development as a constraint and as a contributing factor. Here was his answer, quote, education and respect for human rights, promoting social mobility in market economies is the key to development, not faith. For anyone involved in the efforts of the IADB and other international banks engaged in development, that is a bizarre answer because faith-based nonprofits have played transformational roles in development. It demonstrates, sadly, the kind of antipathy to people of faith that is becoming more and more common on the American left and apparently was the view of at least one former socialist congressman from Venezuela. I do not believe this nominee is an appropriate nominee to represent the United States of America on this international bank, and therefore I object. This objection is heard. Mr. Mr. President, I would like to respond briefly, and then I will soften my request of my colleague. Mr. Martinez was chased out of Venezuela because of his opposition to the regime that my Texas colleague opposes. Mr. Martinez, in Venezuelan politics, I didn't concede that he was a socialist. You, you, you said that I did, I did not. He was a member of three parties, the Democratic Party, the Justice First Party, and the Democratic 
Action Party. Those were the parties that he served in. And for one period of time, because of disagreements with the parties, he was an independent member. So that's why the fact checkers that went through this in September rebutted the allegation that Mr. Martinez was somehow a hard man of the left. He is an opposition leader. And the proof of that is he's had to do something that is very difficult, leave his own native country, leave family behind, be branded a traitor by the very regime that both of us would want to counter, and lose family assets and wealth to the regime. I mean, do we want him to sacrifice more than that as evidence that he is in opposition to the Maduro regime, left his country, lost his wealth, been branded a traitor? Is that not enough to demonstrate his bona fides as an opponent of the Maduro and Chavez regime? And with respect to the other claims made by my colleague. He doesn't like the answers that Mr. Martinez gave about faith. He broadens that to suggest that people on the left are against faith. I resent that. I was a missionary in Honduras for a year in Latin America with Jesuits in 1980 and 81. And I know an awful lot of people on my side of the aisle, some who talk about it a lot, some who may not talk about it, including you, Mr. President, who faith is a central motivating factor in our life. So if you don't like an answer that Mr. Martinez gave, that's a good reason, I guess, to vote against him. You have that right, but don't use it as an opportunity to say about everybody over on this side of the aisle that we have a hostility to people of faith. Many of us have sacrificed a lot and acted to do so because of our faith. Let me soften my request since my colleague, I understand he would like to vote against Leo Martinez and doesn't like a UC notion that would sort of lump everybody together to advance him, I would ask unanimous consent that at a time to be determined by the majority leader, the Senate consider the nomination, PN 1028, Leopoldo Martinez to be U.S. Executive Director for the Inter-American Development Bank for a term of three years, and that the Senate have a vote on that nomination, a debate and vote on that nomination. Members able to vote no, but with no intervening action, the motion to reconsider be considered made laid upon the table. No further motion in, be in order with respect to the nomination that any related statements be printed in the record and that the president be immediately notified of the Senate's actions. Is there objection? Mr. President. Senator from Texas. Reserving the right to object, I, I note a couple of things. First of all, nowhere in the senator from Virginia's eloquent remarks did he dispute in any way, shape, or form the chronology I laid out about the absolute disaster the Biden foreign policy has been in Latin America? Nowhere did the senator from Virginia dispute that as a result of Joe Biden undermining our friends and allies, far-left Marxist anti-American leaders over and over and over again have risen to power, hurting the region and hurting America. That has been a consistent, deliberate pattern to undermine our friends and allies and to elevate vocal enemies of America. My friend from Virginia also said he did not concede that Mr. Martinez Nusete was a socialist congressman. I believe what I said is he didn't dispute it, but actually in saying he didn't concede it, my friend from Virginia perhaps inadvertently, did concede it because he described on the Senate floor how Mr. Martinez Nusete was a member of the Democratic Action Party in Venezuela. Democratic Action is a party that is formally and officially part of Socialist International. It is a socialist party. And that is one of the factors that I believe renders Mr. Martinez Nusete inappropriate for this nomination. Let me finally talk about faith. I do not remotely question or doubt the senator from Virginia's faith and the good faith with which he advocates his positions. He and I served together on the Foreign Relations Committee. I will say an unusual thing about my friend from Virginia. 
he virtually alone among Democrat senators, will sit and patiently listen to my remarks in public and often in closed, classified settings. I am certainly not immune from the senatorial disease of being sometimes long-winded and enjoying the sound of my own voice. Although I will note, I'm not the only member of this body afflicted with that particular disease. Senator Kane regularly will sit and listen to my arguments despite the fact that the topics on which we are debating, he disagrees passionately with me. I try to reciprocate the favor and listen to his arguments, despite the fact that I disagree with many of the things he says. And I know that the senator from Virginia cares deeply about his faith. I also lament the rise of explicit hostility to faith among the left in today's Democrat Party. I recall when one Democrat senator questioning a nominee in the prior administration suggested at a hearing that his Christian faith made him unsuitable to serve in the post to which he had been appointed. I recall when another senior Democrat in a confirmation hearing for Justice Amy Coney Barrett said infamously, the dogma lives loudly in her by which that senator meant Justice Coney Barrett's Catholic faith. There was a time a few decades ago when we had a bipartisan embrace of religious liberty. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act passed this body overwhelming with Democrat and Republican support, was signed into law by a Democrat president. Sadly, that Democratic Party no longer exists. Today's Democrat Party routinely votes in ways directly hostile to people of faith. And I need not look to prior confirmation hearings. I can look to votes on the floor of this chamber yesterday. Yesterday, in advancing their, their gay marriage legislation, Democrats stood united against religious liberty. My colleague, Senator Mike Lee from Utah, introduced an amendment that would protect religious liberty, that would prevent the Biden IRS from targeting for persecution churches and charities and universities and K-12 through schools that believe marriage is the union of one man and one woman. Every Democrat in this chamber had the opportunity to vote in favor of religious liberty. And yet, the Democrats in this chamber overwhelmingly voted against protecting religious liberty. That is a sad development for this body. I wish we were back in the days where the protection of religious liberty was a bipartisan commitment. I hope one day we can return to that time. Regardless of where today's American Democrats are, Mr. Martinez Nusseth in his written answers demonstrated an unusual antipathy to faith, even among nominees in the Biden administration. And for all of these reasons, his antipathy to faith and his history as a socialist congressman in Venezuela, I believe this nominee is inappropriate to represent the United States on this international bank. Therefore, I object. Objection is heard. Mr. President, I would like to respond, in, but I'm not going to, just to remind my colleague from Texas that the bill we passed yesterday had ample protections for religious liberty that many Republicans in both houses have found very acceptable. But my colleague from Rhode Island has been very patient in waiting to take the floor, and so I will yield the floor.